Welcome back to Uncovered, everyone. We have another really exciting episode coming up with our resident physio, Simone. Welcome back to our podcast, Simone. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Um, Today, guys, we are going to talk about a really um, important topic that doesn't affect every single pole dancer, but that does affect um, quite a majority um, or even a minority. You might feel like a minority um, in the pole world, depending on where you are and how many others are around you, but hypermobility. And you might not even know if you are hypermobile. You might not have been, I guess, I don't know if diagnosed is the right word, if it's a condition or it's just a, you know, part of how your body is. Um, But we wanted to dive into, give you guys a little bit more education on it and um, how you guys might sort of approach your hypermobility to be safe for pole dancing. Um, So, Simone, do you want to give us a little bit of an idea of what is hypermobility? Can people actually diagnose themselves or do they need to be able to go to someone to say, yeah, you are hypermobile? Uh, Yeah, so you can semi-diagnose yourself as (laughs) hypermobile. I mean, hypermobility is something that is uh, is quite common actually amongst the general population, but there's just many different degrees of hypermobility. Um, But when we talk about, um, you know, specific types of hypermobility, then you do need to see someone to get diagnosed. Um, I guess let's start with what joint you know, hypermobility is. Um, Effectively, um, hypermobility is uh, what we would define in the physio world as greater than average range of motion of a joint directly related to connective tissue laxity. And so this is where the ligaments and the capsule, all the passive structures of the joint that usually help to stabilize the joint, um, they have lost some integrity and have a lot more movement in them. And so this causes more movement of the actual joint. And it's not actually related to flexibility of the surrounding muscles. And so this is probably the big you know, if you take one home, one thing away from this podcast today, mm-hmm. this is the only thing you take away. Hypermobility is not flexibility and flexibility is not hypermobility. So I can certainly confirm <laughs> that because I have some hypermobile joints and I am not flexible yeah. at all. Oh, so, sorry, I just want to interrupt real quick. So can you have, if you're hypermobile, does that mean you're hypermobile everywhere? Could you be hypermobile in just one area of your body? How does that work? There's lots of different types of hypermobility. And so you can talk about localized joint hypermobility. So that's just one joint. You can talk about peripheral joint hypermobility, which is a a condition where you have only your fingers and your feet or your hands and your feet. uh, The only things that are hypermobile in the body, which and nothing else is, which is really interesting. Not many people have that one, but it's definitely a thing. Mm -hmm. And then you can have generalized joint hypermobility, which is, you know, five or more joints of the body. And they are usually bilateral, but doesn't always have to be so it could be just one shoulder one elbow it's it's usually a bilateral condition but you can definitely have one particular joint that gets affected more um and you can have uh hypermobility related to trauma so um we're talking about you know you've gone and injured yourself you've dislocated shoulder so therefore your shoulder the structures around the joint have been torn and there's some hypermobility because they're not providing the same passive support that they used to uh, versus you can have hypermobility secondary to a connective tissue disorder um, that's uh, autosomal autosomal um, hereditary dominant is my uh, understanding of it. So um, there's a autosomal dominant hereditary secondary to that. There's so much going on there. All these ways, if you're if you're a geeky nerd like me and you like to know all this sort of stuff. Basically, it's genetic. <laughs> That's kind of the crux of the matter there. So, um, yeah, there's a lot to do with hypermobility, but the, the first thing to know is uh, it can be in one spot, it can be in a couple, or it can be a lot more, and it's uh, certainly not flexibility. I think um, just because we're kind of setting up some definitions for people to understand for the, the rest of the podcast, it's kind of important to understand what flexibility is instead, and flexibility is your ability to change your joint position or your range of motion into a predetermined end position. So I, your ability to move your arm overhead to end a range, okay, versus your shoulder moving around in the joint, extra movement than what it's supposed to. So when you say that, so what, what makes up flexibility? Is flexibility a combination of like your nerves, your muscles, 
and then your yes, joints? Yes, good question. So your capacity, like our body's capacity for flexibility comes from multiple structures. So your muscles, your connective tissues, your joints, your nerves, and it's completely controlled by the nervous system. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, something like hypermobility instead is um, pretty much it's – it's controlled by your, your ligaments. Uh, so effectively, if they have been damaged or if they're not as strong as they should be, then that's what you're going to get joint hypermobility. So is it true that you can train yourself into, like if you say we're training as a child and you keep overusing that in sort of a, um, a range yeah. that is kind of high- Hypermobile. Can you make yourself hypermobile absolutely. at a later absolutely. from that? So like trauma. Trauma, absolutely. But that's instead of yeah. opposed to having one acute episode of trauma, that's repetitive trauma. So absolutely. And that's a really common thing that we see in child gymnasts where they're pushed into positions mm-hmm. um uh, you know, inappropriately and their body develops this persistent state of, you know, of repetitive trauma that then causes joint hypermobility. Um, but we also see it in adults as well. So we see like, you know, baseballers are a perfect example of this where they, um, you know, normal external rotation range is sort of 90, 100 degrees and they can access, you know, all the way back to ridiculous ranges of like 130, 140, 160, like I'm not a baseball physio, but I'm sure that they can get, you know, quite far back. And that's because it's actually, to a certain degree, beneficial for them. And they are able to achieve this increased range of wind-up to allow for the pitching that then increases torque activation across the shoulder and the front of the abs to then allow for a more powerful pitch. Um, but there's obviously a downside of hypermobility. So it can be beneficial in some cases, but in that particular case, it does increase their risk of shoulder instability and increases their risk of dislocation and subluxation. And it's a really common thing that we see in baseballers. Yeah. Uh, so oh, there's so many, so much to this already. So yeah. can, first of all, can you develop at any time? So could you be like 40 years old and then develop hypermobility from trauma of like the shoulder or trauma is that correct yeah, yeah. so that particular type of hypermobility absolutely that's an acquired hypermobility so that's something you can develop at any point in your life okay and then the second thing i have like you said and i know people will be thinking about this because like we spoke about previously having those hypermobile joints is like looks pretty in positions and if you can develop it why, like, why wouldn't people want to develop hypermobility? And then well, that's a great question. And then so I know it's a bit of a effed up way of thinking, but then strengthen at that end range to be if someone was really obsessed with being like the best pole dancer ever. Like you look at Felix Kane, and she's obviously super hypermobile, and she does these amazing tricks. Like some people will be like, I want to get to that point, and then I'll control it at the end, and then I'll have this amazing is it. Or is it better to train the flexibility to try and achieve the lines? It's better to train the flexibility. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think you knew the answer to that as you yeah. were asking me. Um, the reason is that most of the time, so someone like Felix Kane has a um, genetic hypermobility. Um, I mean, I, I don't treat Felix. I'm sh- sure she probably won't end up listening to this, but but I, I don't treat her, so I don't know her from that yeah. point of view, and I wouldn't share that information even if I did. Yeah. But, like, you can tell from a distance yeah. that she has genetic-based hypermobility, and she's trained to that level of hypermobility her whole life, mm. but she's trained her strength to that capacity yeah. as well as her, so she's trained her active flexibility as well as her, her passive flexibility. So there's mm. been a combination of both of those. Um, the difference, if I go back to your question mm. about, you know, all the lines and stuff, the difference is forcing a joint into the movement and pushing it into range is yeah. really quite damaging to a joint and can cause some serious long-term issues. So, for example, you know, you see those people who have so much knee hyperextension mm. and then to make their lines look longer, that's quite damaging to a knee joint yeah. if you're pushing that range versus some people who have acquired hypermobility, I'm sorry, not acquired, um, genetic hypermobility. That's the way they're born, but they have the strength to control that position. If their knee just naturally goes back to that, and that's just them, that's mm. how they're born, and they they you know can can manage that. But they've got the strength to control the position. Not as not as worrying for me from my point of view. But if you are not hypermobile and you're not born hypermobile, yeah. then you should not be trying to uh, you know uh, obtain yeah. hypermobility is the best way to explain it. So yeah. if you trying to push your body into hypermobile range is going to cause some serious issues versus if you've been naturally born with hypermobility, then 
that's it comes with its own issues. Like everyone thinks high capability is this great thing. It's mm. not. It's actually really, really hard to control that end of range of position. And they, uh, hypermobile polars and patients, they really struggle with this. And there's a big spectrum of hypermobility that we'll talk about through this whole session. But if we're talking about purely the asymptomatic hypermobile spectrum mm. sort of patients, then um, they just have to make sure they've got really good strength around a joint to be able to control it. So when you say asymptomatic, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so asymptomatic meaning they're not experiencing pain or symptoms and they won't go on to experience anything of that sort throughout their life unless they go and, you know, injure themselves down the street whilst they're walking across the road or something like that. Um, so these are, these kind of account for a small amount of population. I think um, it is thought to be anywhere between 4 to 13% of the population have asymptomatic hypermobility spectrum disorder. Um, hypermobility spectrum disorder, by the way, is just a really fancy term that we give to anyone who's hypermobile. hypermobile. Uh, previously, it used to just be like an under umbrella term, like general hypermobility you know, issues, they kind of just had a whole bunch of different random terms being thrown out. In 2017, the um, Earl of Society released a new statement and basically have changed all the terminology. So I'll try and stick as much as possible to that terminology in um, in today's podcast. Um, but yeah, there's what we basically deem as asymptomatic versus symptomatic. And then amongst the symptomatic, there is a big spectrum of different mm. conditions that fall into that. Yeah. Mm, interesting. I, uh, how do people um, identify if they are hypermobile? Because we were speaking off air before um, and you were saying that you might be hypermobile, but you might not be able to bring a joint into a position because your body will stop it. So mm. how do people identify and how do people know what is normal for your arms or for your legs or for what, whatever? Yeah. So um, if we're talking again about the um, more the asymptomatic yeah. side, yeah, yeah. Um, because the symptomatic will have other yeah. symptoms that go along with it. But if you're asymptomatic hypermobile, um, there's something that we've got called the Baden score, which is a really simple tool. It has a ceiling effect, which means it doesn't pick up everyone who's hypermobile. Um, it's not mm. for every person. And then there's, uh, you know, a floor effect of it as well. But um, the easiest way to test, and I mean, we can probably show you now if you're watching the video, um, and I'm not hypermobile, so you'll see very quickly that I am not. Um, first thing is to bend your wrist at 90 degrees and pull your thumb down towards your forearm. So if you can touch your forearm with your thumb and Steph is kind of close. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I've got about like, a so, yeah. I've got about a centimeter on that side. Yeah. That was there the wrist I broke, but I can, Re yeah, I can do it on Release this side. Is yes. that? There oh. you go. Yeah. So you would score two points there. We might find out whether you guys are hypermobile today or not. <laughs> yeah, mine goes, I'm not like, does it matter where your arm, I'm kind of holding it, trying to hold it in the right, maybe. So about 90 degrees and it's, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, just straight down from there. If you can touch your forearm, if you can get anywhere close, then you're, you're pretty much, that's one point. Now, Steph, you said something that was really interesting that's really helpful for people to know, because if you've broken your wrist before, mm. it was previously probably hypermobile before... And, and that's where I found out that it was hypermobile because going back and um, I had a really, really good hand therapist and she um, was like, she told me I pro may not be able to get to pole because when I came to her, I literally had a claw after my surgery and she ripped my fingers back, made me cry. Worst person ever to me at the time. But we worked, like I've still got really good like movement there, but I feel more pain when I do this because I've injured it and it's not to the same level as the other side, but previously it was very similar. So yeah. I just get a little bit more resistance yeah. in this side. And the chances are that because you've, you know, fractured that joint that you're not getting your full flexion range of the wrist. So you were previously probably yep. a plus two there in terms of points. So we're going to assume for both of you at the moment that you're both scoring two out of two. Okay. Well. All right. I know. Let's find out. <laughs> I was going to say, I hope you guys don't mind sharing this on air. <laughs> no, that's, that's fine. All right. The next thing is you pop your hand flat on a surface, ideally. I uh, won't be able to show you, but you guys can also do it. It doesn't have to be on a surface. I mean, effectively, you want it parallel, and you're going to pull the pinky back and see if you can get it past 90 degrees. So if you can get it past 90 degrees, that counts as one point on each side. So Steph can get that there. Uh, my yeah, it's going to be like my, like, 
I feel it's like in these joints, they like push, my knuckles push. Mine's not really getting to 90. No, so you're, you wouldn't score on those ones then. Yeah. So, so far you're a two out of four. And then Steph, what are we thinking there? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll give you a two. So Steph's a four out of four there. Yeah. Okay. Then the third thing we can look at is our elbows. So whether they hyperextend. So what we're looking at is can they straighten? And do we straighten greater than 10 degrees of hyperextension? So can, you know how some people have really high yeah. elbows? Yeah, elbows. So Steph is one of them. And it's sometimes really quite challenging to see, but effectively you'll see an, a line of an elbow and then it will just basically keep on going past. Because my biceps are so big. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And that's great. That is what helps you protect your elbows. Sure. <laughs> so I'm not, I, I'd probably just give you a point there, Steph, on both of those. But now you're, you're definitely not there, so you're yeah. sitting happily at two. Yeah. Um, and then the next thing we look at is our knees, so whether they can extend past, again, zero degrees. So we're looking at a greater than 10 degrees extension. So I won't be able to do this because of my, my headphones in terms of attachment, but as I say, if you ladies have the space and you can get up, it's basically just standing and can you get your <laughs> knees straight back or, and the other way you can do it is actually sitting down and can you seal off the floor. <laughs> I can I definitely, like, I think... Oh. I realize I should have shaved I my legs today. Think... <laughs> <laughs> um, I definitely think when getting my heel off the floor, it comes up pretty easily. Yeah, I think for yeah. memory step, I think you are. Yeah, on both of those. Yeah, that's how it. Oh, it's about Steph. Oh, about um, Renee. Uh, I don't. Is she on the floor? I don't think so. Oh, oh, no, you have so. to show me later, Steph. But yeah, I don't think so. And then yeah, I, I, yeah. cool. We'll, we'll see. But yeah, yeah. interesting. And then the last one, so Steph, Steph at the moment, you're like sailing way ahead. Yep. <laughs> um, the last one we do is, can you bend over and touch the floor flat with our palms? So now this is something that is usually quite an acquired skill that we as pole dancers, most of us get. So this is why, you know, the Batons is, is maybe not so uh, reliable as a high mm-hmm. ability scale because a lot of pole dancers can usually do that. And a lot of females who aren't pole dancers can usually do that. But that's kind of considered hypermobility of the hips and lower back. In reality, um, I quite often get people to bend over, touch the floor. Yep, easy, tick, they can do that. Now we do like a little bit of a crouch squat. Can they get their butt to the floor whilst squatting, whilst keeping their heels Mm. to the ground? So if they can do that, that's kind of a a very big sign that they're quite hypermobile of that area. So there's a few different ways to test it. Um, But effectively, that's a score out of nine. Um, Mm. And so that is a really simple way that you can diagnose whether you are um, hypermobile or not. So a Mm. score greater than five out of nine, so anything including the five indicates that you have hypermobility. It doesn't indicate that you have a a, um, connective tissue disorder, so it doesn't mean that you have been born with something necessarily. It may mean that you've acquired joint hypermobility over the way, so whether it's acute hypermobility or, uh, you know, a repetitive trauma um, overuse hypermobility that you've acquired, it just does mean that you're hypermobile. And then as a result, it means that you need to be really careful around those joints because they have more um, movement of them and they're more likely to be unstable and cause you issues down the track. So that's Mm -hmm. for those who are asymptomatic. And, I mean, symptomatic people can also test themselves using the patients, but we go into a little bit more depth with those ones later on. Mm, That's, yeah. So what are some um, symptoms that you might have if you are hypermobile? If you are hypermobile and symptomatic. um, Mm. So it depends on what category you fall under. So um, most of the time we're looking at pain. So we're looking at, um, if we're talking about the People who are hypermobile, who have been born with hypermobility, but don't have an extra medical condition that I'll go into later on, um, the most of the symptoms are usually musculoskeletal. And so it may be that they're, you know, hypermobile through their knees, hypermobile through their shoulders, and they are more prone as a result to injuries. And it might be like we spoke about in our previous chat, that they're more susceptible to hurting their shoulder um, in say a twisted grip or they're, you know, in their back bends, they're reaching really far back and they're loading up their spine and they're not able to activate their muscles correctly. So generally speaking, they have that uh, reduced 
reduce proprioception, so spatial awareness, they find it a lot harder to activate their muscles because the joints prefer to take the load. But we know that the joints really shouldn't be the thing that takes the load. It should be the muscles around the joint that's supporting it. That should be the, the driver of the load. Mm. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, because I'm, I'm just thinking, like, I'm trying to keep this as much in order as possible to help people follow at home because it's <laughs> such a big topic. Like, hypermobility is a huge topic. Huge topic. I think um, probably the one thing I haven't really spoken about yet is, is collagen. So, hypermobility is effectively um, for the ones that have genetic hypermobility, the whole um, autosomal dominant hereditary connective tissue disorder. <laughs> uh, again, big mouthful there. <laughs> it's because there's usually an issue with the collagen that your body produces and collagen is represented throughout the whole body so it makes up about 30 percent of the protein concentration in our body um, and it's a really really important um, component of our extracellular matrix which is effectively what's a part of our muscles and our connective tissue our ligaments and our joints and it's really important that we have some stiffness in our connective tissue that allows for force transmission um, and adaptation to different positions so when our skeletal system is supported by active structures as well as the active structure structures then we can function day to day um, without really too much of an issue but when there's a collagen issue so when we're collagen atypical that then the joint, <clears throat> sorry, the joint laxity and the hypermobility then loads up the joints. We lead to extra range of motion without the support. And then that then leads to the injuries. I think I just kind of need to clarify that just so everyone can follow along at home. And with collagen, I've looked into that recently. <clears throat> there are so many different types so of collagen. Like you go to a pharmacy and it's all hair, skin, nails. Like collagen obviously plays a huge part for our body and different tissues in our body yeah. and collagen is uh, not just in our muscles and our ligaments collagen is found all throughout our whole body so it's in the walls of you know our arteries in our di digestive tracts in our skin our hearts in our eyes um so when we have a collagen tissue disorder and these are the real medical ones that we'll go into later but when we have one of those we can get lots of different symptoms and so that's mm. when it can become a real issue and there's a lot of um wonderful people out there, wonderful polars out there who are hypermobile, but there's a lot of wonderful polars who are hypermobile with Ehlers Danlos syndrome or another connective tissue disorder and they may not realise it and they haven't really put two and two together. And that's where, you know, there's just some warning signs and flags that hopefully this podcast will help. If this is maybe you, it might flag you with uh, flag some mm. issues to you and you can start putting things together. Um yeah, there's a lot of um, connective tissues disorders or hypermobility syndromes out there. So not just Ehlers Danlos. We'll speak about that one today. But there's osteogenesis imperfecta. There's rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Marfan syndrome. There's just so many of them out there. And if at the end of this podcast you suspect that that may be you, then it's worthwhile chatting to a GP and getting a referral to see a geneticist, a rheumatologist, or a specialist, or deciding what pathway you want to go down. And we can talk about that towards the end of the podcast. So if someone was to have one of those things that you just um, sort of mentioned, if they weren't to go um, and see someone, what would be the sort of implications for them? I guess if they're not doing any exercise, it, it, obviously everyone listening to this podcast, well, most people are going to be pole dancers and are doing exercise. Yeah. But if they weren't to address it, would they, would something happen later? Like, or is it just to perform the best you possibly can? Good question. I think there's just, like I said, a spectrum. Yeah. So if you're asymptomatic and hypermobile, there's no need for you to see, you know, a specialist. There's absolutely no need for that at all. But you need to probably work with your physiotherapist um, to address your areas of hypermobility so they don't then develop into musculoskeletal issues down the track. Mm -hmm. If you're symptomatic and, you know, you, you kind of remember, you know, from a young age, you've always had pains and bits and pieces, That's and you're hypermobile, but you don't have any other medical issues associated, you're less likely to be a full-blown connective tissue disorder that requires, you know, deep medical intervention. But you still need to work with a physio, even more so because your proprioception, your spatial awareness is probably really quite poor as well as the, the strength of the muscles is really poor. And you're that 
probably that person that finds it really hard to activate muscles. So you're going to have to do quite a lot of intensive rehab and that's going to have to be ongoing versus right. the person maybe who just has one joint that's a little bit hypermobile and needs to work on some stability there. Um, versus, again, the the population that have the medical uh disorders mm. and they're more likely to need some medical input and it gets a bit complicated because they don't necessarily have to see a specialist sometimes it's just about getting a diagnosis and mm. for a lot of people out there they really feel like they need a diagnosis it, it validates you know a lifelong yeah. journey of pain and suffering and medical issues that they just it, it can be quite overwhelming and traumatic and um, they just feel like they need something. And then there's a lot of people out there who I just sort of sit down, I talk to them and I kind of semi-diagnose them. I can kind of partially diagnose them as, you know, a particular condition and, and we go, okay, is it worthwhile you getting the diagnosis? Talk to me about your personal situation, circumstances. And for them, it might not be required, but the answer at the end of the day for them is to continue working with a physio. Mm. There's some people who are on the more severe side of the spectrum who are, um, you know, they could be symptomatic or Erlos Danlos and they're on the more severe side and they have some medical symptoms and they need to go and then see a cardiologist or they need to see. So mm. there's just a lot. And you'll see as we go on through this podcast, like how overwhelming it can be, yeah. particularly when it comes to Erlos Danlos. Um, you know, I've, we've kind of spoken a lot already about the asymptomatic side of things, but most people out there who are hypermobile, because um, asymptomatic only accounts for 4 to 13%, most yeah. people out there who are, who are hypermobile are really um, – experiencing quite a range of symptoms uh, and it can vary all the way from you know joint pains and issues and dislocations all the way through to some severe gastrointestinal issues um, you know uh, they could be experiencing a lot of urinary pain and you know infections and issues there they could actually be ADHD um, and that's yeah. associated with hypermobility so there's just a range of, of different things um, it's fascinating uh, you can see I, why I'm so I know I uh, I know I'm sitting here and going, holy shit, like hi hypermobility. I, when we were like, yep, yeah. let's talk about this topic. I did not realize this is how deep, like how important it huge. was to probably we, talk we about it. We just thought, well, huge. I don't know about you, Steph, but I definitely just thought it was something to do with like the lines or how your body looked and then it being a bit harder <laughs> to engage. And, you know, we have a lot of people that experience that. And so we sort of wanted to bring to light, hey, like, you know, when you're going through your pole journey, everyone's different and, you know, you might need to work a bit harder because of, you know, what supports your um, joints and bones and stuff you might, yeah. But I didn't realize that people could have all these other issues and I guess not always do we know when we're instructing and coaching people that they have other stuff going on. Um, some people might tell you, oh, I've got these other health issues, I need to be careful. But yeah, you'd never connect it. Like I would no. never connect it in my head. Um, so for those that are listening, I guess, if you have the light bulb moment and go, oh my gosh, like this could all be connected, then I hope that this is very helpful for you. This this is potentially a life-changing podcast uh, for some people out there. And mm. this is... This is why I guess and I was telling the girls before going on to this one, I was actually quite nervous about it because there's just so much information about hypermobility. And it, I was nervous because I really wanted to do all of this justice so that everyone listening out there can get the help that they need if they need it. So I, I think um, it's really important, even if you're not hypermobile, if you're listening to this and it's not necessarily personally resonating with you, but you're an instructor or you know someone who is hypermobile, like it's just so important that this information is out there in the pole community because I strongly believe that a great number of pole dancers, aerialists and contortionists have some level of hypermobility and I would pretty much say that hypermobile people are drawn to these types of art forms because of the way that their body moves um, mm. but it's just very poorly understood in this world a lot of people still you know turn around and go oh i wish i was hypermobile and i'm like no you do not yeah you do not wish you were hypermobile you wish you were flexible maybe but you do not wish you were hypermobile and that's why i asked that question before it's like oh you can make yourself hypermobile like in the joints <laughs> because yeah that, that's where it's come from people have been like oh i would love to have that those aesthetics to it but um yeah, yeah that's it ha it's definitely going to be very eye-opening for some people so should we talk about some go into more of the symptomatic yeah i think um probably one more thing i think yeah. before we delve into eds um is that we kind of touched on it in the last podcast but for those who are hypermobile 
you don't necessarily show other signs of hypermobility in terms of flexibility. So you can be hypermobile and not flexible. Mm. I just kind of wanted to clarify that point yeah. as well, because you may have a really hypermobile shoulder, but because it's hypermobile, it's potentially unstable. And your body does this brilliant job of neuroregulating through the nervous system. And if it detects that you're in any danger, um, it will actually basically limit your movement. So there's a lot of people out there who are hypermobile who actually don't have these wonderful extreme ranges of movement. Mm. So there's a lot of people who I see who actually get stuck with their shoulder at 160 degrees of movement. So they go, there's no way I can be hypermobile. And that's why it's really important to differentiate mm. the hypermobility from flexibility. You can still be hypermobile and only lift your shoulder up to 160 degrees. If your body goes, hey, that's dangerous for me, I'm going to stop and lock and hold on and protect the shoulder joint and stop it from going further. So is that your nervous system stopping yeah. that additional? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very complex, so I won't go into all the, um, the yeah. different bits and pieces, but it's all the receptors of the muscles and the connective tissue in that area. When you go to lift your arm, there needs to be some rolls and slides of the um, – of the actual humerus, here's the shoulder again, but basically the shoulder needs to move in the joint. And if your shoulder is moving a lot more in the joint than it should because the muscles are not providing the stability, then your body um, basically sends some messages through the receptors of that area to the brain and the brain goes into a shutdown mode of that area and stops and locks to hold on because it thinks it's about to dislocate. And it probably is about to dislocate, or it may even be halfway towards dislocating. It may have started to partially sublux through the joint. The difference is with these hypermobile patients is that they're not realizing they're subluxing or dislocating because for them, it doesn't feel painful or it doesn't mm. feel like anything weird or wonderful is happening because their body has very poor awareness and spatial, um, like proprioception of that joint. Whereas for you and me, if my shoulder starts to partially sublux or dislocate, I wouldn't know it. Like I would be mm. in a lot of pain and discomfort. Um, so it's it's really interesting and fascinating uh, with this type of mobile pain population. I've seen many people I have... I have so many patients, sorry, I can always tell you guys, but, mm. you know, a patient I saw online last year who actually the first time I saw her shoulder was actually dislocated and had no idea. Like I was watching her and I'm like, yeah, yeah your shoulder's dislocated. And it like literally was physically stopping her from getting to that point. And we spent, and it, like wasn't causing her grief, wasn't causing her pain. Like and so it, it, it's, you kind of cringe when you think about that. But it's just, it was just sitting in like a completely different position than what yeah. it should be. And if anyone went to passively re- relocate it, it just would have popped back out again. Yeah. Like it just wouldn't have happened. So it's very different than, you know, yeah. my joint and someone else's joint who's not hypermobile. Um, so we spent a couple of weeks working on some rehab and then it was just like a clump and it relocated. And all the muscles started switching on and working. And it was like, I remember it, a light bulb moment. And it was like, I couldn't physically get past here. I was so blocked and stuck. Suddenly like, oh, I can move my arm. So there's just, there's so much nuance and just, it's fascinating. Can, before we move on, can you just describe what subluxation is or like how you sublux a joint? Like. Um, for the people who may not have heard yes, that term. Yes, sorry. Before. Yeah, thank you. Um, so dislocation is when you fully um, basically dislocate a joint. That's a great dis- description. Is it? It's when a, sh- a joint goes out. So, for example, when your shoulder pops out of the joint, that's a full dislocation. A subluxation is a partial version of that. It doesn't mean it goes to 50% specifically. It could just be that it's gone a little bit out or halfway out or maybe three quarters of the way out, but it's not completely out of the joint. And so that's something that we use quite commonly um, in terms of shoulder dislocations, a uh, thing, uh, you know, patella kneecap dislocations are quite often a thing. It's um, really uh, common to dislocate fingers with traumatic sports. You know, you can even dislocate your jaw. So there's lots of joints that can be dislocated. It's much harder to dislocate other joints in the body. So it's much harder to dislocate an elbow, for example, it has to take quite a lot of trauma to do that but it is possible and it's insanely hard to dislocate a hip again okay. there's probably a couple that i've seen that are like unstable hips mm. and maybe they sublux but like i know people go oh my hip's gone out it hasn't gone out there's very like there's probably only one person in my lifetime that i've truly seen that has a dislocating hip and has severe hypermobility disorder is in a wheelchair and had further trauma mm. to the hip so it's really hard to dislocate a hip yeah, just to give you kind of an idea. There are just some joints in our body that are inherently stable and others that are inherently unstable. And that's just the way that the bones are. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 